Today we have Carrie Bush, ADA 504 Coordinator and Interim Dean of University College, Greg Kramer, Professor of Mechanical Engineering in the Russ College of Engineering and Technology, and Don McCarthy, Professor of Communication Disorders and Interim Dean of the College of Health Sciences and Professions, who will all be speaking on ways that we can improve accessibility as well as identify some of the current accessibility challenges that we see today. So welcome all of you and thank you so so much for, for taking time out of your extremely busy schedules to virtually sit down and talk with me today on such an important and relevant topic. You know, I know for me personally, I've learned a lot over the last few years um, looking more into accessibility about what all can encompass accessibility, whether that's from offering, you know, information in other languages or in Braille to how the digital space isn't always accessible, like some of us, you know, who have it a little easier. Um, feel like it is, and then even, you know, design choices that can be made to better help those with disabilities. So I know there's just so much more that goes into accessibility that I know I've personally never thought about, um, even as I've learned, but I'm also sure others aren't aware of. So I am really looking forward to hearing from the three of you and being educated on how we can improve accessibility uh, for all of those around us. So thank you again so much for being here. And before we get started, I would like if each of you could introduce yourself and in, in your area of expertise. Uh, so Carrie, how about we start with you? Hi, I'm Carrie Bush, and as the ADA 504 coordinator, um, my in my role, I am responsible for helping Ohio University be accessible for students, employees, and guests. So um, my background is in counseling, and I spent a number of years working in our office that specifically assists students with accessibility, so I have some expertise there, but over the last um, three years in my new position have helped, um, that's helped me broaden kind of my view of accessibility to looking at the built environment, um, IT accessibility, um, our, our ways in which we make our workplace accessible to employees. Great, thank you. And, and not only for, you know, the work that you've done, but especially in the last year when accessibility has been you know, for education purposes and, and for employees, extremely hard and, and your help has been really appreciated during that. Um, next, can we go on to Thank Greg you. and have you introduce yourself? Absolutely. So uh, I've been with the, the Ross College of Engineering for uh, 23 years, going into my 24th year. Uh, so I'm in mechanical engineering. So a lot of my interactions with accessibility are related to technology, uh, especially building things that make uh, jobs make opportunities more accessible to the whole range of individuals and their abilities. Um, so we emphasize maximizing ability and trying to um, to allow everyone to use their great talents and abilities uh, for their betterment and for the betterment of society. A lot of that takes place in a designing to make a difference capstone experience that we have been running for uh, close to 20 years now. and. Um, and in, in other projects that we do, uh, both locally and internationally. Great, thank you so much. And, and I'm excited to hear more about the Designing to Make a Difference, as I'm sure our viewers are as well, that we will bring up later in this conversation. Um, and last but certainly not least, John, if you'd like to give your introduction. Thanks so much. Um, I'm John McCarthy, and my background is as a speech language therapist. And um, in that work, if we go back even a little further, my undergraduate degree is in music and voice performance. And um, one of the things that really drew me to the field of speech language pathology, in addition to working with singers and other people who are having problems with their voice, was that I learned that there are people who can't really use their voice at all for their daily communication needs. And so um, in terms of global awareness, there's over 97 million people in the world who can't use their voice to meet their daily communication needs. And so when I thought about how much my voice meant to me, uh, and then I really started to think about there were people with developmental disabilities or acquired disabilities or progressive uh, disorders like uh, ALS, people who can't use their voice anymore, um, it really took on uh, a very personal interest for me and one that's um, driven all of my research and work as a clinician um, and uh, as a researcher at Ohio University since 2004. So I look at 
augmentative or alternative ways for people to communicate. Um, if you can't use your voice, what else can you use? Um, and back when I got started before there was a lot of texting and mobile technology, it, it was challenging. Um, but now the idea that people communicate in a variety of different ways, um, that's something people have warmed to, but there's still tons of um, challenges related to accessibility, whether it's physical or um, using voice technology um, that are out there to be considered. So uh, very happy to be a part of the discussion today. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing the backstory. I didn't even know a lot of that about um, yourself and your background. So it makes it even more fascinating for me and I'm sure our viewers as well. Um, so yeah, thank you all again. I do want to preface the conversation by saying that nothing shared in this conversation is legal advice. Rather, it is a conversation to focus on accessibility in practice, and, you know, ways that we can improve to help others. Uh, so our viewers that we have watching, if you have any questions at all for our experts about accessibility, please drop those questions in the comment section of the live stream or feel free to direct message your questions to the Ohio University social media channels. And we will do our absolute best to get to as many of your questions as possible during today's live stream. And if we don't end up getting to those questions, do not fret because we can take those questions and send them directly to these experts to get them answered for you and then send them back to you. So. Without further ado, I say let's start the conversation. <laughs> um, so to start things off, I have a question for all three of you. Um, you know, accessibility, at least to me, I feel like it's such a broad term that really encompasses a lot of different areas. So can you all talk briefly and describe what accessibility means to you and then specifically um, how your work improves accessibility? Whoever wants to start too, feel free. <laughs> Well, I, I guess I, I can yeah, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, so from, from my perspective, um, it's developed into an idea of access to opportunity. Um, there's lots of different ways you can look at it, but um, especially from the engineering perspective, we're trying to identify uh, things that someone who might have a challenge, a physical challenge, a mental challenge might want to do, and then say, what, what needs to change in order to give them access to that particular opportunity? Um, you know, when, when we really get down to the root of things, the, um, you know, the human dignity that we all have, it really flourishes when we're able to, to do our best, when we're able to, to either do work or to experience the arts or experience any type of sports. Even we, we work a lot with uh, youth who want to, who just want to play, who want to be involved just like their friends are. Um, so, you know, they, in order to express our full human dignity, we have to have access to those opportunities. Uh, and so um, the way, the work that we in engineering do to try to, to make a difference for accessibility is really to identify those barriers to access to opportunities and do whatever we can uh, to create adaptive technologies, assistive technologies, workarounds, other ways that can um, can help people access those opportunities. And and uh, it's a very fulfilling thing for all of our students who get involved in this work um, and uh, in the relationships we build with individuals who are just looking to, to try to live out to their full, full potential. Hey, thank you. I, I love saying that accessibility is access to opportunity. I've never thought about it like that, but you're 100% on the money when, when thinking about it. Um, John Earth Carey, would one of you like to go next? Well, I can maybe expand on that a little bit. Um, because I think I have some similar thoughts to Greg. A, a lot of times in um, the work in my office on campus, we are often doing the individual accommodation. So how can we help a student um, access the system that's been created? But I really think of accessibility as the extent to which we construct and design things so that the most people can accomplish what it is that they need to do without adaptation. Um, so whether that's entering a building through a doorway or it could be policies and procedures that may um, disadvantage individuals with disabilities. So it kind of gets to that idea that Greg was talking about access to opportunity. So it's really thinking about um, pro proactively considering a broad range of abilities and designing our policies, our programs, our physical 
environment so that the most people um, can just come in the door or, um, and access what they need to without having to make some kind of special request. So that similar experience to someone who may not have a disability. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great exp expansion on what Greg had said as well. Um, John, would you like to, to comment on that as well? Yeah, thanks. Uh, always tough to come in when people cover uh, so much great ground there. Uh, I'll have to take that into account. Um, but I was reflecting on this one um, recently. A friend and colleague of mine um, gave a talk about accessibility and then inclusivity. And he was drawing a contrast and saying, you know, some places are accessible, but they're not very inclusive. And then some places are, are not all that accessible, but man, they're really inclusive. Um, and so this idea of like, what is it about the access, the, the gaining the physical entry into a, a physical space, or maybe it's a digital space, you know, what is it about actually getting in there um, that's important? And then inclusivity about like, what's sort of the spirit behind it? Of, uh, you know, is there a, a welcoming? Is there uh, an idea of, of bringing people together? And I think, you know, Greg was talking about opportunities and it, it brought that to mind to me as well. Of, is that opportunity there? Is that invitation there? Is that a part of it? And that's really important piece of it. So for me, accessibility, I think of what I would just add in is there is that digital side too of, people who um, want to enter a digital space and that has lots of different meanings. Sometimes it's really liberating um, to get in there and um, be a part of that. Sometimes um, taking away the, the time pressure and in, in getting into something that's more asynchronous can be really helpful um, for, for some people to get more of a chance to reflect on something. Um, and then sometimes having an immediate outreach to people uh, in a digital space is fantastic as well, like this one. So anyway, uh, was just thinking about sort of that both sides of can you get in there and then what do you feel like once you're there? Great. I, th thank you. Like we've only been 12 minutes in this conversation. I've already written things down that I know I'm going to take with myself. So I hope you viewers feel the same way. You know, um, I, I've never thought about the accessibility with inclusivity being you know two different things but related in the same part um i think that's a really interesting topic that hopefully we will think about going further and, and maybe talk about further in this conversation a little bit as well yeah i want to give credit to noah trembley for that one i i, I can't take that idea he he inspired me on uh, on that particular idea so Thanks, there we Scott. go shout out to you for that one no <laughs> <laughs> uh so greg i know you talked a little bit um in your intro it about designing to make a difference. So can you talk a little bit more about that and why you started the program for the mechanical engineering students? Sure, um, and I guess it, the reasons fall on a couple different levels. Um, personally, you know, it, it, early in my career, uh, I was having success on some levels as an engineer, but uh, the connection to real purpose and passion was um, in some cases missing. And, and I had some personal experiences where I, um, I was working with some individuals who, who had some challenges, uh, in this case, probably more on the poverty level or lack of opportunity. And um, it just became really obvious to me that, you know, there really wasn't justice in the world until I'd be happy to trade places with anyone and say they have equal access as I do. So I'd be happy to be in their shoes. Um, and if that wasn't the case, I had to use whatever skills I had and, and abilities I had to try to make that so. Um, and so looking at, uh, for me, within engineering, that meant, you know, how can engineering be used as a force for good, a force for social change, a force to, um, as Kerry was saying, rather than just fixing all the problems, how can we design things so that there aren't problems to fix as well? So, you know, sometimes that's called universal design and other, other terms, but um, trying to restructure things around um, that and, and make that available more obviously to others who might want to enter engineering to make a difference in the world. And so designing to make a difference came out of out of that as well as out of uh, some needs that were brought to us. Um, within the Appalachian Ohio region, there are uh, both individuals who have needs but don't have technical resources as well as small businesses, entrepreneurs, farmers. There's a, a range of, uh, of people who need technical help uh, but don't necessarily have the resources. And really the, the first category of, um, of what we call customers or really partners, project partners that we worked with were individuals with disabilities um, because they were 
<laughs> they needed help, um, and they were uh, they ha- they usually had problems of a scale that a students a group of students could help uh, and actually make a contribution within the period of a year. Um, and for their particular niche product that they couldn't buy themselves, but it would really help them um, in their lives. It would help them either access opportunities for for jobs. We have a lot of projects working with SW Resources in Parkersburg uh, and working with several other groups in the region who who try to make jobs available to individuals with disabilities uh, through their mission. Uh, but they also still need those additional um, jigs, fixtures, adaptations in order to make that really work well. Um, and then also we deal with transportation issues with, like I said, youth sports, uh, lots of different um, lots of different ways that students working on an engineering project can make a difference in someone's life. Um, and luckily over the years, we've been able to, to be successful enough to get recognition in um, a number of national design competitions. Um, the ones that are, uh, there's a group called Ability One, uh, which is a, a federal uh, governmental organization that whose mission overall is to advance employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities. And um, so our students participate and have been very successful in uh, putting forth the work that they're doing for individuals in our region and getting some national recognition for that. That's amazing. And, you know, one, the fact that you're teaching a course like this is so important because it means that you are, you know, sending students who have this interest who want to help design and make that difference. And it's like how many students that adds up to is just so great to put out in the world. And it's like they're going to do the same thing, hopefully, and in, in inspiring others to think about that. So, um, and the fact that you're you know, working and partnering with local businesses and, and other organizations, you know, just shows the 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 point and the change that you can make within this area alone. And and I think that's wonderful. So thank you for for describing that. We've actually already gotten a few questions from social media, so <laughs> I'll go ahead and ask these um, to you. This is from Jill on YouTube. If you could pick one thing to improve accessibility at Ohio University or in higher ed in general. What would it be? What would you start with, and why? So I don't know if Carrie, you want to try to tackle that one first. <laughs> That's a, <laughs> a big one. Out. I'm I'm pretty sure John wanted to go first on the next John, question. No, I'm just one. kidding no, on that I, one. I was sure just saying out. third is yeah. really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you know part of it for me is I one of the things that I think gets really hard is we do have a legal responsibility to meet a, a minimum level of accessibility and so sometimes that creates this fear that people don't want to um, people are afraid they're going to do something wrong they're afraid they're not going to do enough and honestly if there was one thing that I could do it would be to free people of the feeling that they are going to do something wrong and, and to try to empower them more to just, you know, if you have a person with a disability who shows up um, somewhere, talk to them, like, what do you need? Sometimes it's really simple things that can be done um, and don't require a lot of external expertise. So I think it would really be um, just empowering people to have those conversations and reach out to an accessibility office um, or whatever it may be called on your campus as a partner to consult on problems um, and to not be a, afraid to engage and have conversation with people with disabilities about their needs. So I think really just shifting that culture um, a little bit. No, that's great information. Um, you know, it, it sounds so simple, but yet so meaningful at the same time. So take that with you, everyone watching. You know? um, John, Greg, would you like to, to add on to that? Yeah, I am. Um... I think that was the direction I was going to carry is um, it's almost goes back to that idea of the is it more about the inclusivity that is actually going to lead on that and that the the biggest difference to make is is this idea that um, you know we, we can all help each other out uh, as we do this and, and sometimes in figuring out accessibility everybody actually benefits from doing it you know you might figure out something that mm-hmm. that makes something more accessible and it it turns out lots of people benefited from that um, too and so when we all start to get in and say you know what this is worth it 
uh, as opposed to like I have to do this, but to say well, let's figure this out because it's probably going to reveal some some really helpful things. Then I think that's important. Yeah. Um, also, given that the structures may not always be in place, um, if we have that kind of helping orientation toward it, um, mm -hmm. I think it's going to help us to work through it. The only thing I have to add right now, I guess, is more from a, a student perspective. Um, and, and this is probably, well, I'll say this is this is my opinion, not necessarily the opinion of, of our college, but um, I would love to see us get rid of more of the barriers to entry to a STEM degree or an engineering degree. Uh, we have a lot of things that are historical and, and not because of our college, but they are be because of the profession or because of accreditation or because of you name it. Um, and we have people who learn differently, who ex who are able to express their knowledge differently, who are able to you know have all of these very important but different skills. Um, and I'm afraid that we currently shut off or close the door too quickly on some of those students who who otherwise could advance and really, really do great in one of our programs. Uh, I don't know exactly how to do that. I have some ideas, but um, I would like to figure out, you know, ways we could do that. Yeah, that would that would be great. I mean, it makes total sense too when you say it feels like there's like that barrier, and that actually leads into the next question that we have from social media. A little different from like the STEM field, but uh, this person asks. How do you help someone with visual impairment trying to bridge the gap in the sport management athletics coaching field? Mm. So not quite STEM necessarily, but still a field that yeah. there will be barriers in. <laughs> so the, the question is focused on visual impairment? Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess I can, I'll start to give the others a little time to think. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I would just say, uh, you know, from a technology perspective, there are various solutions we could look at. Um, it really, it really depends upon the tasks that the individual needs to do, needs to accomplish, um, and then what is already available on the market, and trying to match those two things. Um, because a lot of times there are some good solutions, um, and if those things aren't available, figuring out how to adjust the work or adjust the capabilities of the individual in order to meet the, the expectations and the needs. So um, it's hard to give a, a specific answer to a kind of a general question, but that's kind of the process that we would normally go through as we're trying to problem solve. Yeah, yeah. and I think, <laughs> yeah, and I think Greg, your response really hits kind of the heart of it is it's focusing on what does it mean to be a coach? Um, and what is it really, right? Like, a coach brings that strategy um, the and expertise and one of the things they may happen to do typically if they don't have a visual impairment is look out and be able to see things for themselves. But thinking about, um, you know, seeing is not the heart of coaching, right? It's understanding the premise of the sport, um, what individuals need to do to enhance their performance, what's the strategy of the game. And so thinking about different ways that we could creatively help someone take in the visual information that they can use to make those decisions that they need to make as a coach to, um, you know, help a player enhance their performance. So it's, it's really focusing on what does it mean to be a coach and not these ancillary things that um, may often be part of coaching just because the majority of people historically have not had visual impairments in that field, so. Yeah, I, thanks, Carrie. I, I completely agree. Yeah, that task focus is so important, and especially when you talk about if there is technology that's going to be involved, well, it's mm -hmm. it's going to be a tool that's helping you achieve some kind of task or something that you're going to do. I guess the other thing that I thought of in my own work is that when I work with people who can't talk but also can't see, um, for a variety of reasons, then you say, well, what what's that interface going to be like? A lot of my work has been saying, well, what is the experience of that person? And so, you know, how do how do they experience the world? How do they take in information? Use that to make decisions. So sometimes it's understanding. Well, you know, how do you go through taking information and and use that to be a coach or to do the kind of things you want to do? 
And then how can I make sure that you've got access to the, that kind of information so you can continue doing whatever it is you want to do? And I, sometimes there's um, a thought that maybe it's always tactile or maybe it's always auditory or whatever it is. It's, there's going to be some variation there. So um, finding out, um, you know, why don't you tell me about how you how you do this or approach it? A lot of times you just start by asking the person questions about um, what it is they do. Yeah. That makes sense. And John, so you, you spoke a little bit about technology. Can you elaborate a little bit when it comes to, you know, what do you see as opportunities and challenges when it comes to like new smart home technologies um, for people and especially people living with disabilities? Yeah, um, technology is a, a great space to be in. And I remember um, when when a lot of voice activated technology came out, there were people in my field who were saying, wow, what's this going to do for people who can't talk? And I said, um, this is actually great. Um, because we have devices that produce speech for people. And it used to be so hard for people with physical disabilities. You had to like program in a remote or like rig up some kind of special system to turn the lights on and off. So now it's all built like right into the smart speaker. Now we, we have all this infrastructure. So now all you need is to produce speech that can say, you know, Alexa, do this or Siri, do that or Google Home, do this. And those were things we already kind of had figured out. So it actually ended up being ironically um, kind of liberating for people who can't talk to actually have now a voice activated interface. <laughs> um, and it, it's been really exciting work to be a part of. It's still, there's a lot to to make sure that now a, a speech generating device can, can act, uh, successfully do this. But um, there've been a lot of really great things with smart home technology um, that have opened up a number of new opportunities for people. So uh, I'm very excited about it. Um, love to hear from Greg and Carrie though. On, so. I think that's a great response. Um, I guess the only thing I would add is every time that there's an advancement in technology, um, you know, there are there are often questions about, okay, who is this good for? But um, if we take the, and I don't want to paint with too broad of a stroke, but if we, if we paint the picture of okay, what new doors does that open? As John was saying, almost always there's a path forward to more access if we do it right. Because the more capabilities we have, the more we can problem solve around that new technology and, and continue advancing opportunities for people. Uh, some, so sometimes it takes a little bit extra work or fill in a, a, a missing piece, but it, op it opens up more opportunities. Because some of these things that are available now, we've been trying to, on a small scale, develop them, you know, for for one one off kind of solutions. And it's so hard and it takes so much time. And once you have that piece, then you can fill in the gaps a lot easier and you can serve a lot more people and meet their needs. So overall, the that advancement helps, I think, but we just have to manage it as we move forward. Yeah, Carrie, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think we can leave it there. Those were great responses. Great. Well, I was going to say, because there's uh, another question from Julie on YouTube. And once again, Carrie, this seems a little more directed at you, but Greg oh and John, God. please feel free to chime on in. <laughs> so Julie asks, how can students and faculty best connect with others interested in this topic to collaborate and discuss initiatives? For example, is there a university club or organization? Um, there has not, um, in terms of a student club or organization, there have been over times um, student organizations that have come and gone. I don't, I'm not aware of any in particular right now. Um, I do think in recent years, students, for students in particular, Student Senate in their diversity um, commissioner as well, I believe um, they've done a really great job of including disability in part of the diversity conversation and I think pulling together students who have an interest around disability and accessibility. Um, so I think that is one way. There's also this for faculty staff and it would probably even be open to students. Um, this is a little bit more of an IT focus, but the folks in our OIT office have um, facilitate the digital accessibility network, which is really meant as a place for folks to come together and learn about digital accessibility um, in a very practical 
kind of way also to be able to give some feedback to IT and our office on ways that we can improve digital accessibility. So those are some things that come to mind. Um, and we have also, it's, um, I hate to refer to the last 14 months, but it, we have historically had a group of, um, a group that has kind of advised our office um, but that's been on pause the last year and a half while we've had a lot of transitions. So we do hope in the future to um, bring back a, a group. Um, it was really open to um, students, faculty, staff, individuals who live with disabilities, individuals who may um, have a family member or work with, it, with people who live with disabilities. So we're hoping to resurrect that again in the future. And I was going to say for our viewers as well, um, we can go ahead and put in the comments a link to the Digital Accessibility Network for those interested as well. Probably won't happen until after the live stream is over, but do be on the lookout if you're interested. Uh, Greg, John, would you like to add anything about, you know, ways or maybe the ways that you have seen in your individual colleges that faculty and students can collaborate? I was going to say that. Uh, sorry, Craig. Oh, I thought I, thought I, I was going to say that um, through student organizations has been one way. Um, so we've got 24 different student organizations in my college alone, and then that's not even, you know, university wide. Um, and there's a lot of interest from from students that kind of rises up, you know, outside of the curriculum. And many of those are, are service oriented ones. Um, some of them are about awareness. And so um, I think getting involved in um, in those organizations can really help. There's frequently a faculty advisor, um, but I I think that as those groups you know look at their um, how they want to channel the efforts of their members, that they're great vehicles for ha having these kind of conversations too. If that's something the organization wants to advance, but I look around and I see there there's a number of events that are sponsored by a lot of these orcs and. Um, Sometimes I, I think we um, we just need to get the word out more uh, and invite people to these discussions. So I, I feel like there's there's already some great things happening uh, on this. Great. The uh, you know we have this group, the Center for Campus and Community Engagement. Um, so instead of just thinking inside the walls of the university, you know there are some groups within the community that I would also say that. Um, that we can reach out to. And so anyone who has an interest, um, like John said, we love when, when students come forward with a, a passion or an interest, you can almost always find somebody who's going to want to, to fuel that fire. Um, and we love that, but also we can connect with uh, others that, that are in, in our region that might uh, be focused on a particular issue. Great. Thank you all for, for answering that question. And, and kind of going off of that, you know, resource, resources within the university um, that we can get involved with to to learn more or collaborate with others. Um, can you all kind of talk about resources outside of the university that you found are helpful, um, you know, when navigating accessibility issues and, and trying to find ways to improve accessibility? John, you haven't started. <laughs> yeah, that's I was going to say, I'm trying not to jump what? in. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll take third um, seat. <laughs> for me, um, you know, one thing I would point out is that um, for for students who are part of the um, uh, system uh, in the public schools that's oriented around um, individualized education plans, that um, there's a there's a process of transition. Um, as people start to move out of high school. And I've been a part of some of those processes when I was working uh, as a clinician. And um, they, they really are about learning uh, and trying to start early and thinking about, okay, well, what are your plans and what are the kind of things you want to do and accomplish? It's challenging sometimes to, to move from the education system, which has a lot of built-in supports to it, um, to looking at it differently um, outside of school, but it's not that there aren't supports there. I mean, there's things like uh, the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation, and there's a number of different um, uh, community organizations that are very interested in helping out. 
Um, but they're not a um, sort of one-stop shop a lot of times in a single document like you might have in the education system. So um, I, I think uh, in terms of what I've done, um, there have been great community partners um, in the Athens County Board of De Developmental Disabilities, for example, a great, great group that I've worked through there, Center for Independent Living, um, the, some of these social uh, places in uh, the southeast uh, in, in Ohio for Centers for Independent Living. Those have been great. Um, there are centers within some universities that are really, you know, external facing. So. Um, things around accessibility and assistive technology, for example, where they're really aimed at, you know, providing loans and um, uh, other kind of help to people in the community. So um, that was just, I don't know, as I react to that question, I just think about how I had to learn that um, when I was moving out of the school system. But there, there really are some great um, uh, organizations for support out there. Great, thank you. Yeah, Carrie, Greg? Well, uh, I can say that uh, one of our local groups, Passion Works, is great for inspiration. They're great for a lot of things, but if you ever want to be inspired, um, drop on by Passion Works and you can't help but be inspired. Um, beautiful art, beautiful relationships, um, you know, and it is, as most things, you know, it is all about building relationships and they're so, so great at focusing on building community and building relationships. Um, and then, you know, th this is a little bit more focused on um, kind of our profession of engineering, but the professional societies all have an aspect of accessibility um, and uh, programs where you can not only learn, but you can uh, you can get into a community with others who have those same same interests. Um, and there's associations for rel for rehabilitation engineering and others who are who, people who walk the journey with an individual and try to. Uh, within a particular company or more uh, broadly um, trying to understand that person, their abilities, and uh, try to kind of amplify those abilities. So uh, those are just a few of the things I would mention. Yeah, and there's um, just to add a little bit to that, there is um, the Job Accommodation Network, so JAN. Um, yeah. If anyone look, just Google's Job Accommodation Network, um, that is a great resource for employers who are wanting to become more accessible or to um, help think about accommodations for employees with disabilities. It also is very helpful for um, individuals with a disability. So I think that is a great wealth of information for folks who may be wanting to understand a little bit more, start to think about what are some of the ways that you do create access. So that's um, the one other thing that I would add to what John and Greg shared. Great, thank you. I know you said um, about the job accessibility and everyone just lit up and I was like, okay, clearly that is something to to keep take note of there. Mm -hmm. um, so going back, I know we talked a little bit about technology. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about it and, and Greg kind of um, towards you, can you talk about the types of accessibility challenges that you've been able to address through adaptive technology? Yep. Probably the easiest way is just to tell a few stories, and I'll try to keep them very short. But um, so uh, Maddie came to us with a need to she wanted to participate in bachia ball, a an adapted form of bachi ball um, for uh, to allow youth to to fully participate in some type of a sport. Um, and this this one goes pretty far back, but um, but. Our students were able to engage with her and her family and walk this journey with them. Um, and so she um, she had cerebral palsy, and so she had limited functionality. Um, but she had a very very active mind and knew what she wanted. Um, and so she was able to direct. Um, in this case, I think it was her brother who was the primary person who adjusted the system. But our our engineers figured out how to design a an easy to adjust and adaptable ramp system to allow her to uh, participate in this sport. Um, and there was a, a competition on OU's campus and um, they were, uh, she was able to use the system, did very well and, um, and her family was there. And you know, there were lots of tears shed because 
she was able to, to fully engage in a sport that otherwise she wasn't able to. Um, so, you know, that's just a, a simple idea of a mechanical system that was able to allow someone to, to use their mind in some gestures to direct something and accomplish a task uh, that she otherwise could not have accomplished. Or, you know, so there was this this freedom for her that uh, she hadn't really experienced very much um, in, in being able to do, do a task that she wanted to. Um, and then on the other side, um, we can take, uh, so we work with a lot of um, job accessibility uh, because it can really, again, a, a job for an adult with a, with a physical or mental challenge is a pathway to dignity and it's so, so important. Um, so uh, some of the jobs we were working on recently have to do with, um, for SW resources, there's they have, um, they make some signs. Um, so some where um, they're kind of vinyl printed mm -hmm. and uh, there's a, some difficult tasks with respect to uh, removing the, um, they call it weeding, getting the, the um, vinyl material from the sign away once it's been cut, once the sheet has been cut uh, and getting that off so that just the letters remain that you want for your sign. Um, so if you can imagine a lot of hand dexterity would be needed and some special tools. Um, and so uh, one of our teams came up with some uh, some ways that uh, to, uh, so one, one of our things we often do is cr make it easier for someone to grab something. So adjusting some of the existing tools to make them easier to grab uh, and then kind of semi automating portions of the system that would um, that would make it easier for them to manipulate the large sections of, of poster board. Uh, so that ended up being a, a roller type system where um, it would bring the work to them and they could easily uh, peel off things with the, the help of the, the curvature as, a, as the uh, poster would go around a, a roller. Um, so, so those are a couple. Um, <laughs> I guess one other I'll mention just because it's fun and then I'll, I'll be quiet is uh, working with Passion Works. Um, there, uh, there was an artist there who his main problem um, was grabbing his art tools. And a couple people had worked over the years with him and it got some help, but uh, a team two or three years ago uh, was able to really do a deep dive with him, see what worked and what didn't with his other uh, uh, adapt adaptations and um, ultimately create kind of a four bar linkage mechanism that would support the weight of and, uh, and kind of uh, position his uh, art uh, utensils, his art instruments and allow him to really just guide things along. Um, and so worked really well, he was happy. One of the students involved in the, the team uh, hired him to paint a portrait for him. And so by the end of the year, he used that system in order to to paint a painting uh, that the student then purchased. So um, that gives you a couple examples. Oh, those are amazing. Just bring so much joy knowing like, you know, going back to the, what you first said at the very beginning about access to opportunity. You know, like this opportunity should be available to as many people as possible and having this adaptive technology um, that allows that it just brings so much joy and, and it should be you know the goal that we all are working towards uh, so speaking a little bit more about technology and, and ways that technology has improved or has helped uh, John this is kind of directed more towards you can you talk about how you know smartphones and tablets have adjusted to help accessibility needs and if there's still room for improvement um, within that you know area of technology yeah so when I started working with people who uh, can't talk, there were no mobile devices and there were no iPads or iPhones or anything like that. And so there were a lot of customized solutions for people. Um, and the, the essential problem was saying, OK, we have somebody who can't talk. And then people would say, oh, well, I guess they could uh, use sign language. And we'd say, well, OK. but." Um, they might not have the physical dexterity or they might not be interacting with other people who know sign language either um, and they might not want to uh, they, they're not necessarily part of the deaf community oh well maybe they can just type everything they're saying okay well again dexterity maybe they don't have the ability or well, what if they just don't know how to read and write yet because they're little kids 
And so there's always these layers of well, what what about this and how are you going to respond to it? And each time if you had to in, introduce a customized solution, you were trying to build things that, that could accommodate all these range of different needs. As smartphones came along, though, you had this tool that had incredible processing power in it, uh, really amazing, just in your pocket, and was connected. Um, so you had the ability to pull things in from the cloud, or you had cameras built in. I mean, all these things that we've been stitching together for years, they just said, oh, well, here it is right now, and you could just buy it and get a phone plan and, and have it. So it changed things around. There were a lot of applications that were developed then um, that, that came outside of people who had been doing it for a number of years in private companies, but now you had independent developers who said, hey, I have a personal interest in this, or I, I think there are opportunities here, and we had a marketplace where now we had tons of new ideas that got injected all at once, and, and it was really great. I think it sort of jumped us forward in, in thinking about it. Um, but the essential you know, really difficult problem still remain. I mean, it's still challenging to find ways for somebody who has trouble moving, has trouble talking, has trouble um, maybe even seeing, and then they're also learning to um, to read and write and develop in their language. I mean, these are still really tough problems. So even though mobile devices are cool uh, and powerful, um, these are still tough problems. So. I will say the the other thing was that um, these were now companies that were mainstream, large, huge companies, um, and working with people with disabilities um, wasn't necessarily you know why um, they started or what their you know primary mission was, but what I will credit them for doing is really building accessibility teams. So whether it's Microsoft or Apple or Google or you know whoever it is. I've seen tremendous advances in the accessibility of these um, devices, these mobile devices. And if you go in to uh, your phone and just look at the accessibility settings now in 2021 versus what was there when they first came out, it's staggering. I mean, they've, they've considered hearing and vision and motor access. And just going through and looking at actually the, the number of different access methods your phone can accommodate now, uh, it, it's pretty remarkable. Um, so I, I definitely would um, put that in there as an exciting part of what's happening um, and uh, ways that there were initial challenges, they're, they're better. I mean, these are still things though that are stacked on top of a mainstream device. So there's there's always things where you, you gotta make it work for a person, um, but uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. So in my classes, I usually just have students take out their phone and, and we go through the accessibility settings on it and they're blown away um, yep. by, <laughs> by not realizing just how much they could do mm -hmm. um, from an accessibility standpoint on something they've been carrying around for years. Yeah, well, and it's like I, you know, I've had this phone for, oh my gosh, I don't know how many years. And I've never had a reason or even thought about looking into this because I'm like, I've got everything I need. I'm fortunate that, you know, what I need is right here. And, and you're right, I'm looking now at this accessibility tab in my settings and I'm like, the amount of things to choose from on here to help others is just, for me, overwhelming because I don't even know what to look into first. Um, but for those who are in need of this, like, this is wonderful. Um, you know, clearly, like you said, like, there's still improvements to be made in so many different places, but um, it is nice that there's progress and that there are these options and opportunities for people. Uh, so speaking a little bit, you know, about ways that we can be more accessible and ways that businesses, organizations, you know, we as a society, uh, Carrie, this is me a little directed towards you. Like, you know, although businesses, educational facilities, and public services have that legal responsibility to be accessible, you know, many individuals also want to be more inclusive of people with disabilities. So, do you have any suggestions on how to help? And, and kind of going off of it, it's kind of a two part question for you. Um, what can businesses and organizations do that are more simple steps that they can do, you know, today or this week to make um, you know, themselves more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a couple of things come to mind. I think one thing is to, um, if you have customers, if you have students, if you have friends who have a disability, ask their opinion. Really, individuals with disabilities are the experts, right? Like, we're here 
as experts and we have um, obviously knowledge that we've gained, but really putting people with disabilities in that driver's seat to understand um, what is their experience, what would make the most difference, um, how is it that they could be accomplish what they need to accomplish when they come into your to your business. Um, so actually reaching out to some local disability organizations um, and trying to get some feedback. I know in the city of Athens, the Athens City Commission, um, at least at one point had a group that was working with some businesses to come in and kind of do some assessments. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind. Excuse me. And then I think the other is just to, again, think about, um, and this kind of goes back to something that um, Greg said earlier, think about what is it that's really necessary and not just what are the ways we've always done things. So be, being willing to let go of this is just how we've always done it or this is the most efficient way and just being open to thinking about new ways of doing things. Yeah, I, it makes total sense. And, you know, I feel like I've often heard when talking to people about ways we can, you know, do better for others and, and help. It's always like we can't stick to the same old methods. Like if it's not working currently for them, it's not going to continue working if we keep doing it the same way. Um, so I think, yeah. you know, that's a really good point to bring up not once, but multiple times in this conversation. If, if we can take, mm -hmm. you know, clearly we're taking away a lot of information, but that is something that I think going forward needs to constantly be thought about. Um, so let's see, we have a few more questions, but unfortunately our hour is almost up. <laughs> so I will leave with one final question and then um, after that allow each of you to, to add any comments that you have. But, um, you know, there's so much going on today and I can acknowledge there's, you know, been change and improvement in accessibility measures, but what do you think are some of the biggest challenges um, today when it comes to accessibility? Mm. Got you all stumped there, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, I can start. Um, so um, part of our part of our challenge with accessibility is our challenge with kind of change in general. There's a lot of things happening in our world right now. And it's easy to come up with excuses why this can be delayed or why there's something else that's um, quote unquote more important or you know our our interests are need to be focused elsewhere um, so you know one of, I think one of our biggest challenges is remaining true to the vision of um, things are better for everyone if we're all involved if we're all included mm -hmm. if we all have access to opportunity um, and we need to just be really creative about how to make that happen and really committed to the mission of, uh, of making it happen. Um, you know, we don't all have a lot of influence, but we all have some influence and we can make a change in our area of um, our, our spheres that where we have expertise or where, where we have the ability to, to advocate or to, to make a change. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure if that's exactly the, the <laughs> answer you're looking for, but I think the uh, the biggest challenge is it's easy amongst many issues for things to be relegated and and sometimes just become one more among many other things. Um, and you know, but if we, so, we don't want to lose lose the vision and um, and lose the the emphasis on making positive change continuously because it will be better for all of us and. You know, all of my experiences say that when we work together, um, that we all benefit. So that would be my statement. Going along with um, what Greg said, I mean, Greg brought up universal design before, and for me, one of those one of the challenges in accessibility is we have rapid advances in technology development, and they say, "Oh, wait a minute, we need to make sure everyone can use that." And then you get rapid development in the technology, and they say, "Okay, well, how are people going to use that?" And I've I've frequently experienced the idea of accessibility being an after the fact kind of thing that we have to build in or make happen. And mm -hmm. if we ever got to the point where you know, as Greg's talking about, where there's this idea that 
hey, from from the beginning, can we think about it that way? That would be amazing. Um, so that we're not always catching up to something, um, and that instead we're we're right there at the beginning, and then then focusing on the personal side of it, just the the connections, the people, the communication. Um, that would be great. Um, and so for me, that's a big challenge. Now I left lots of things for Carrie to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I know how it feels to be the one to have to talk when all the good things have been said. Um, but no, I I mean I think Greg and John have really hit it, and it's you know so I think one one way to think about this is right we're um, always in a rush to get the great new thing out there right we want to we want to pilot this we want to be in the lead at this and it's often at the expense of accessibility and so what you are saying is we would rather be first instead of include the most people um, and so when we rush um, to bring thing new things online but before we understand the experience that all people may have with that we're really making a choice about what we um, who we want to include in our community whether that's as an educational facility um, a city um, you know your own immediate friend network when we rush to be kind of the first and get things done at the expense of being inclusive it really makes a very strong statement um, particularly to those people who are excluded from it, even, and it's really easy if you're not one of those people who may be excluded, it's really easy to let that fall off your radar, so. Wow, what a big statement to say in that. I mean, I, I've never thought about it that way before, you know, like you'd rather be first than, than have as many people included as possible. Um, and I feel like that probably does happen way more than it ever should. Um, that just, wow, that hit me really like in the face as to, to how and why we need to be more accessible and it's not a race. It's, you know, it's about inclusivity. It's in a, it's about allowing people to have the opportunities and as many people as possible to, to have those opportunities. Um, who I, I wonder, I hope everyone else also like took all that you three just said, um, away as much as I did right now, but uh, I want to leave the last few minutes open just to see if there's anything else, any other additional comments or information that um, you would like to, to say to our viewers. I wish we could have this conversation last so much longer, but uh, there's so much that could be talked about, uh, but I respect all your schedules and in, in the fact that, that you're taking this time. So yeah, if there's any additional comments or information that you want to share. Yes, I'll start with a, a one final story slash invitation. Um, we have this neat project that's been going on for a couple years with uh, um, our local library. You know, they have this great book a bike program, and um, and they've been looking at making more accessible options available. And so uh, we've been working directly with them to try to create a full user rider experience um, for. For anyone, for uh, an individual with a disability, or we have a lot of, myself included, a lot of people who are getting a little bit older who might might choose a different type of a biking experience. Um, you know, so we had some students develop a, an amazing sidecar uh, for a bicycle this year. Another group is working on some some pedaling that doesn't require doesn't add to the propulsion, but adds a a fun feature, so you get more of the the rider experience. Um, we're planning on uh, probably working with Passion Works in the future to try to theme it or to try to create a um, you know a more visual expression. Um, so you can see like the pieces fit together. And um, and some people, um, one of the instructors at Beacon School heard about this and reached out and said, "Hey, can we do something similar for some of our?" So um, so I guess my invitation is, you know, if you get involved, things kind of build on each other. Um, if anyone has a a need for technology, please reach out to me um, and we can talk about including within our designing to make a difference projects. Um, but there's beautiful stories that start when you get in relationship, when you get involved, when you start doing something. Um, so my, I guess my call to action would just be do something, you know, and good things will happen. Yeah. 
And I actually can build right, you know, I was thinking right where Greg is like, start somewhere, be open to feedback, don't be afraid to get something wrong and be ready to change. I mean, that's really what it is, right? Like, um, this is very complex. None of us are going to get it perfect, but don't let that paralyze you. Um, just start doing and learning and being receptive to feedback and make it a continuous improvement. I was going to come back real small on it just for a second. Um, Carrie's point about being first um, reminded me sometimes in social media, people are like, oh, let me just get this thing out there. And they'll, they'll put up a picture, right? They'll put up a photo. Um, I want to have it out there and say, um, just in the interest of Global Accessibility Awareness Day, you know, I just encourage you to try playing around with your alternate, um, the, the alt text. Uh, the next time you post a picture online, just fill in the alt text line. Um, at, for for me, it just it help, helps keep you mindful of saying like, hey, let's think about everybody uh, and things we're doing. It doesn't actually take that long. And actually, it's kind of interesting to put a little caption uh, along with your your photo that you're putting it out there. It makes you think a little more about like, why did I take this photo and why am I sharing it and what what's important about it? Mm -hmm. um, it's a great exercise. I think it's a good one just uh, thematically for the day. And it actually doesn't take that long. Great habit to get into. That's great. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't even know that half of this stuff was available. And so talking with the three of you today, um, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys so, so much for having this conversation. Um, I hope the viewers got as much out of it as I did. I, I have a notebook just jotted down different things that, you know, like Carrie, you said, you got to start somewhere. Places that I plan to start somewhere and do things. John, you know, I'm going to try looking at my accessibility features now after this. Um, and Greg, you know, the, the designing by difference, I feel like there's so many different ideas now that I, I already want to reach out and ask you more questions about. Um, so thank you all, because this has been phenomenal. And um, I, to our viewers, if you have any other questions or you want to get in touch with any of these experts um, on accessibility and talk more with them, please feel free to contact Ohio University and we will get those questions to them um, or connect you with them as well. So thank you all so much again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks Thank so much. You.